All right, cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome to the FireSim and Shipyard tutorial. Uh, I'm Sagar. Uh, I'll be doing a quick, hopefully, uh, intro session uh, before we jump into all the hands-on material and all the technical content. Uh, so just so that you can find us uh, for help, uh, these are all the people uh, who are presenting today in the top row and our advisors are below. So uh, I'm Sagar, as I pointed out earlier, Jerry is standing up up here uh, and Abe is standing up back there. So you can flag down any one of us. Uh, Vignesh will also be here a little bit later uh, for help uh, uh, if you have any issues with any of these things. So just quick re recap, if you weren't here at the very beginning when I talked through what happened here. Uh, so basically what you should have done already is to fill out this form uh, this Google form should have sent you first a Google forms confirmation email, and then a second email that looks like this that had a IP address, pr a private key, uh, and some instructions to let you log in. Uh, and then once you're logged into the manager, uh, you should have run this uh, and hopefully uh, got it to print out done. So if this didn't work for you for some reason, uh, flag one of us down uh, before we move on. Otherwise, you won't be able to follow along with the tutorial. Okay, uh, so uh, why are we here? Uh, well, I'll give you the usual spiel that we're in a golden age in computer architecture, right? We've lost a bunch of traditional scaling techniques, uh, but for an architect or a system software person, this is kind of a dream, right? Because everyone wants custom microarchitectures and these hardware and software co-design systems, right? But it's also a really nice time to get to have direct impact as researchers, right? So there's this large uh, and, and growing open source hardware movement uh, and now we have this open ISA that can run interesting software and large software stacks that we actually care about. But we can argue that we were sort of in a dark age in computer architecture tools for a long time. And if you think about what we need to do good architecture research, we basically need tools that let us evaluate systems that we build on a bunch of uh, metrics, right? Obviously it needs to work, but then we need to measure performance, power area, and things like frequency. And especially if you're working in small teams building big systems, you need the tools to be agile and you need the tools to do a lot of heavy lifting for you. Uh, and on top of that, before we didn't have any good open IP, right? It was hard to even get hardware to build your thing on top of. Uh, and so we had to do things like build abstract models sort of out of necessity. There was no way that any one person could build up all of this infrastructure, then do research on top uh, and get anything good out of it. Uh, but the world has changed a lot uh, recently. We have a lot of good IP showing up uh, in open source and software compatibility that lets us run big software stacks on top. So then the question is sort of what's stopping us from uh, doing good research using all these tools. And it's essentially uh, how the tools were designed uh, by nature. These tools were generally designed to be operated by large groups of engineers in industrial environments, rather than having you know, 10 engineers or a few grad students in a lab. And they're basically three hard questions that the tools need to answer, right? The first is, where are we gonna get a collection of IP that works together and not just the hardware IP, but also the software IP? And then how do we actually get performance measurements out of these designs that we build, right? It's great to go write RTL uh, for some accelerator, but if you can only run it at one kilohertz, five kilohertz, we can't run big, big software stacks that are interesting. So we need some way to run it fast. Uh, and then of course, we would like to make sure the design we're building is realistic. Uh, and so we'd like to at least get ASIC QR feedback. So things like area frequency, uh, and then maybe also tape it out and ideally have portability across different backend tools and processes. So I'll argue that what we're gonna show you today answers these three hard questions. So where are you gonna get a collection of well-tested hardware IP and the software that goes with it? That's gonna be Chipyard. How are we gonna quickly get performance measurements out of the systems that we're building using something like Chipyard? That's FireSim. Uh, and then how do we get ASIC QR results quickly uh, and, and in an agile way? And that's gonna be Hammer. So basically, if you put together these three tools, which we'll do throughout the tutorial today, you'll get to be able to do all of these things, right? We can make sure our design works and we can measure performance, power, area, frequency uh, for these real hardware software systems that we're building uh, that are complex, but we can do it with small teams of engineers. And today you'll do it just by yourself, right? It'll be one of you operating all of these tools to build interesting stuff. So then you might ask, well, what can we actually build using this stuff? Uh, Obviously, we can build kind of vanilla SOC style systems you see on the right hand side. So what can we put in them? You can put in a variety of RISC V cores, things like rocket chip in order core, uh, sonic boom out of order core, uh, and some other cores developed outside of Berkeley, as well as a ton of different sorts of accelerators, lots of peripherals and IP, as well as FPGA simulation models to let you get accurate performance results uh, when you run on the FPGA. 
But we can do much bigger than just modeling the single SOC system. We can scale all the way to modeling thousands of nodes on cloud FPGAs uh, using hundreds of cloud FPGAs. Uh, and this is sort of the original purpose of the Firesome work that I'll talk about a little bit later on today. Um, so we can scale down from that single SOC that's now just a spec in this diagram uh, up to thousands of those SOCs modeled in the cloud, all cycle accurately, cycle exactly uh, uh, for evaluation. All right, so I'll give you kind of a quick plug about the growing community around these tools. Uh, so at this point, there are more than 200 mailing list members uh, for FireSim uh, and almost 1,000 unique cloners per week. Uh, there are a bunch of projects with public FireSim support. You'll hear about some of these today. Uh, some of them you can uh, check out publications pages and, and so on. Uh, also, a couple of companies that have publicly announced using FireSim. Uh, so Esperanto uh, at the RISC V Summit a few years ago announced using it for pre-silicon validation of some of their tool, uh, of some of their designs. Uh, Intensivate, Sci5 had a validation paper at VLSI talking about validating their pre-silicon measurement with FireSim against actually uh, shipping silicon. And uh, Galois and Lockheed Martin also use this as part of uh, DARPA FET. Uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, but we have a workshop tomorrow. Uh, and one of the key figures at Galois is going to give a keynote about how they use uh, FireSim to enable some of this stuff in DARPA FET. So uh, what was DARPA FET? So to take a step back, there was a program called DARPA SIF, uh, basically designed to uh, get uh, producers to build hardware defenses to address common software vulnerabilities. Uh, and so DARPA FET uh, was basically a follow on to say, how good are the defenses that were built in? <laughs> I don't want the audio. Okay, let's pause it. Uh, so there's a marketing video that talks about what DARPA FET does. But DARPA FET basically uh, was designed to evaluate how good the defenses developed in Sith were. Uh, and several of the designs uh, in uh, Sith were hosted for attack in FET in Firesim. Uh, one of these was a project called Morpheus 2 uh, from UT Austin, Michigan, Gita Labs. Uh, again, hosted on Firesim for FET. And over 500 attackers over the public internet tried to break Morpheus 2, uh, working for pretty large bug bounties, think 50K uh, US dollars, and none of them succeeded. Uh, of course, the none of them succeeded is a testament uh, to the Morpheus 2 work, uh, but Firesome held up well enough that, that they could attack these systems uh, and, and actually get reasonable and in, uh, interesting results. There are also a bunch of academic users across a bunch of conferences. Uh, this is just a sample. There's over 20 additional papers listed uh, on the Firesim website. These are all papers that use Firesim, not papers about Firesim or its internals. Uh, and a bunch of these papers have also won uh, awards at various conferences. And so at this point, Firesim has been used in published work uh, from authors at over 20 different institutions. And these are both academic and industrial institutions. And this is actually published work, and it's not just citing the paper, it's actually using Firesim in the project. Oops. Okay, uh, so some quick logistics for today. Uh, so what the machine that you're working on, the machine that you just logged into is called the FireSim Manager, right? It's this vanilla compute instance on EC2. Uh, and we'll refer to it as the manager for the rest of the day. Uh, and essentially what's gonna happen is you're gonna do all of your work on this manager machine. In the background, when we do things like run simulations or run Vivado to build uh, simulation bit streams, all of that will automatically get farmed out to additional instances in the background uh, they get launched for you on the cloud. So you, from your perspective, will just be working on this machine, and your simulations, for example, will magically run really fast on a group of FPGAs running on the cloud. So today, we'll really just have to worry about this machine. Uh, but if you dive into like fire some development using very advanced features, uh, you can also poke around on these machines. But today, we'll just stick uh, over here. OK, so the very first thing we're going to do today, since it's kind of a long latency operation, uh, is kicking off a FireSim FPGA build so that you can run your own build starting now. And then by the afternoon, when we start running FireSim stuff, uh, you'll get to actually use your own build that went through the whole FPGA build flow, Vivado, AWS backend, and all that stuff. So uh, what you should do on your uh, manager instance uh, is run these commands. And what will happen is you're going to start a tmux session so that in case you get disconnected, this keeps running in the background. Uh, you're going to run FireSim manager in it, given this flag. You can enter your email address when it asks you. All this is going to use the email address for is to send you a notification when your build completes automatically by email. Uh, and then you'll actually run the build by running Firesome Build Bitstream. We'll talk about the kind of magic that's happening behind the scenes later on. There are a bunch of configuration files that are preset, so we know we're building the right thing and so on. 
Um, once this starts, this is gonna take obviously four or five hours. So you can just disconnect from this uh, Tmux session with control B, then let go, then press D. Uh, and then you can continue on doing the rest of the stuff in the tutorial. So this will just continue running in the background. So I'll, I'll stop here for a couple of minutes. Uh, if you're having problems running this again, flag us down uh, and we can help you out. Uh, so what we're running right now, that it, this is just we're building uh, doing a bitstream build uh, for some hardware design. So we're we're running it, so you don't have to do it later. Yeah, yeah. It's so like if you work on your design, you then have to run this to get it to build the flow. So basically, the the main downside of essentially any FPGA based like simulation emulation platform is that that latency, and we like we don't do anything to change that. I see, but yeah. but once you build this, then this is yeah. kind of like it, it's what is this kind of like a library? Like you said, and then it's to... it's building a bit stream that gets flashed on the FPGA. Uh, so like this will basically take all the hardware components that are encapsulated in the config this is building, run it through Vivado, so you get an FPGA image. Uh, and then later we'll also build like the host side driver components that talk to this, uh, but that's fast. So we don't have to worry about that. So we're just kicking off like the build of the stuff that goes on the FPGA, uh, since that takes a few hours. And how do you, I guess, is this like a runtime front on your FPGA side of things? Does yeah. Mean, oh, so then you say, hey, I want to add something and it has a little space that it just can't be all reconfigured itself. Uh, not quite. So we are we're basically baking down one complete image for an entire simulator for one design. In this case, it'll be like a rocket core, like a single rocket core with a very simple memory hierarchy, uh, so that it builds fast. So when we change something, where will we yeah. change it? Or how does it? How does so it, yeah. it depends what you want to change. So if you want to change the hardware design, there are two different ways. So if you're actually changing like target RTL that you're writing, okay. you will rewrite the RTL and then you'll rerun this build bitstream command, and you have to wait a few hours, okay, so, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. There are certain parameters that you can change on the fly uh, because uh, what we do is we take the RTL design and we wrap it in various models uh, so that you get correct performance when running on FPJ. And I'll talk about all this a lot in a lot more detail oh, later on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but basically, there are certain models that have runtime configurable parameters. So even though they're baked on the FPJ, they're designed so that you can change certain parameters on the fly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So then it depends on what you want to change. Yeah. How long does it be? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And as a designer, you can also kind of design with this in mind, which we do with Accelerator sometimes, where like we know for design space exploration, we want to sweep certain parameters. So in the RTL design, we bake in the ability to sweep those parameters too. Yeah. If I wanted to change something in the pipeline, add a or something, yeah. that would be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Cool. A uh, quick show of hands who was able to run this successfully and detach. All right, cool. So we'll move on. Uh, and if you're having problems again, flag us down. All right, so I'm just going to quickly wrap up this intro by talking about what we're going to do today. Uh, so this is the intro overview session. We just got set up with EC2 instances, and we gave a quick overview. Uh, Jerry, next, uh, you'll get a break from doing interactive stuff, and he'll just give you a quick overview of what's in Shipyard, uh, sort of designs you can use, and so on. And then we'll get back to hands-on stuff. Uh, actually talking about how to build custom RISC-5 SOCs and how to customize designs in Shipyard. Uh, then Vignesh will talk to you about the Hammer VLSI flow and how to uh, actually build chips using Shipyard. Uh, then we'll have lunch. And then the afternoon session will be all about FireSim. So I'll give a quick intro uh, to FireSim. This will answer some of the technical questions that were just asked uh, in some more detail. Uh, and then we'll go hands-on building hardware design. So here we'll kind of return to the build we just launched and talk about what actually happened and how it was configured. Uh, and then we'll talk about how to build complicated workloads with a tool called Fire Marshal that's also included in this flow. So think uh, essentially encapsulating all of your workload requirements, including Linux distributions and so on. Uh, then we'll actually run a FireSim simulation on cloud FPGAs. We'll uh, run ResNet 50 on a hardware accelerator for machine learning. 
Uh, we'll talk about how to debug designs uh, on the FPGA. So Firesim is a bunch of debugging tools that let you figure out what's happening if things are going wrong in your design on the FPGA. Uh, and then we'll do a demo of Firesim's local support. So everything you'll do today is on cloud FPGAs, but Firesim also now supports local FPGAs. So you can easily scale between your local platform for doing kind of small simulations. And you know when you have a deadline, you can scale onto the cloud on hundreds of FPGAs. Uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, and it'll be the end of the day. Uh, Okay, so uh, any questions real quick about the agenda? This is also posted on the tutorial website, which is just fires.im slash tutorial. And it'll take you to the current tutorial website. Uh, we're trying to upload all the slides right before the talk, so you can follow along if you can't see the screen or something, or you need to go backwards or forwards. Uh, and if something isn't uploaded, just flag us down and we'll, we'll make sure it gets uploaded. And one last uh, thing I wanted to pitch. So uh, we're running tutorial here today, but we're also running a workshop tomorrow. Uh, and the workshop is basically uh, a bunch of cool projects that have used or contributed to Firesim or Chipyard uh, are giving their own talks. Uh, there are 10 talks tomorrow, including a keynote, uh, as I mentioned, from folks at Galois uh, talking about the DARPA FET stuff. Uh, and then nine more presentations about projects that have used Firesim and Chipyard uh, at, at various places. Uh, and so this will take place tomorrow. Uh, again, here at Ask Plus, and we'll also record and live stream all of this. Cool. Uh, and lastly, just thanks to all of our sponsors, uh, AWS, uh, and a bunch of other folks for letting us share instances with you and run all of this stuff. Uh, so with that, uh, any quick questions? Otherwise, I'll hand it off to Jerry. Cool.